Hi everyone, so this is going to be my um, slightly overdue Renee Reviews and Rants video on the film Snow White and the Huntsman. And a few people asked if I could do a rant on this, because I've mentioned it in some other videos, and I thought, well, I don't know if I really have that much to say that hasn't already been said by other people and said better than I will, so I'm linking everyone to Melina's uh, review on the film, because she covers it much better than I'm going to, but... Yeah, I went to it with no expectations, and if I had any, they were low. Um, because the trailer alone, I thought, okay, I should try and set up a context for this. Um, as you know, I like dark retellings of fairy tales and dark renditions of them. But I like them only if they're done right, and done well, and done intelligently, and handled in a, in a subtle way, and in a, in, a, in a clever way, and not overtly obvious and heavy-handed and things, because, um, well, that can still have its merit, especially if you're not, um, familiar, I guess, with darker renditions, so you kind of need it to be shown to you in a more straightforward way, That then that can, you know, be beneficial, but I think that it tends to just get irritating if it's done in that way, and I feel like it's a lot of wasted potential to make a better film and a better story out of it. So... For example, um, was it last year or the year before, I can't remember, that Catherine Hardwick's um, Red Riding Hood film came out, and I knew that that was going to be really obvious. Now, on the one hand, I was glad that someone thought to do it just because it took the obvious um, subtext of the original tale and, you know, and made it clear to everybody. But on the one hand, it did it, but on the other hand, it did it really, really poorly, and the film was hilarious. Uh, put him in the, put him in the, what's he say, put him in the elephant! Best line and worst line. Thank you, Gary Oldman. Um, everyone was hamming it up and the dialogue was terrible and how did the guys have their hair styled in that way? It was ridiculous. So, um, yeah, I just laughed the whole way through it. But it was sad in a way because it was lo lots of wasted potential on something that could have been done really well. Um, but, I mean, you know, I should applaud Catherine Hardwick for seeing the subtext in the tale and wanting to work with it. So, it took on, it sort of took on the idea of slut shaming and um, and sexual uh, awakening and maturity and that sort of stuff, but it did it so badly that it kind of didn't matter and I wish they had just ignored that and not bothered because they didn't do it well. And such is the case with Snow White and the Huntsman. Um, it seems that it's so often, and Melina covers this so much better than I do as well, it seems so often that Snow White is the fairy tale that people like to do. Second after that would probably be Cinderella, but Snow White's one of the most popular ones to cover and to redo all the time, and I don't understand the appeal, really, aside from the fact that, for the most part, filmmakers really like to focus on the Queen, which is fine, because, as always, villains are usually just much more interesting. But Snow White is a really dull protagonist, and I don't know if I've ever seen a film version of Snow White where they've actually <laughs> managed to make Snow White interesting and remotely believable and somewhat human and just a worthwhile character. I don't think any of the versions I've seen, even though a lot of them have boasted fantastic queens, no one has had a good Snow White. The first Snow White I've seen on um, the, the screen, be it the big screen or the silver screen, is um, probably uh, Jennifer Goodwin's um, portrayal in uh, Once Upon a Time, where she actually has a personality and she has her own story and she has things going for her. So that's really the only Snow White that stands out in memory. And so I don't understand why the appeal is to keep doing this particular tale because it's going to be innately flawed because you have a really freaking dull heroine. Um, okay, so the trailer alone I thought, oh, I can see what they're doing here, it's going to be really obvious and trite and they won't do it well because, I'm sorry, I know this is probably going to sound really harsh, but the moment I saw that Kristen Stewart was in it, I thought, but she's not, she can I liked Kristen Stewart when she was 13, 14, and she did Speak, and she did Panic Room, and her earlier stuff, I thought, yeah, I, I, like, I like what you're doing there, I can see a lot of potential. And now she's just, I don't know, the life has drained out of her and there's nothing going on. And there was nothing going on in this film. And so I thought, well, any chance they had of making Snow White into a character is... is been diluted right away by the choice of casting there. And the fact that they were taking the really obvious route with making her, like, 
fierce and empowered and stuff by just giving her a sword and some armor. And that's the other thing they were trying to do, the Joan of Arc thing, which of course, as Melina points out, it doesn't work as a comparison because Joan of Arc died, bitches! And she was a religious icon and she was shunned by people and that just, it doesn't work. It does not work. Um, so yeah, they thought by giving Christian Stewart some armor and a sword, it'd make her seem empowered and girl power and she's standing on her own and feminism, yeah. And it didn't happen at all. Um, because they didn't give her a character. So they worked the idea of Snow White being this innately good human being and her innate goodness and purity is what w was her character. It was the excuse for her character. So it shrouded over everything else. She had no personality traits. She had no real dialogue. She had nothing to do except walk around really aimlessly and be this innately good person who had this magic effect on everyone and everything. Which didn't even make sense, because she apparently had this healing powers and mystical goodness because she's so friggin' pure, um, but yet she couldn't heal people when they were, when they were wounded. So I'm like, so you, you can heal but you can't heal? What, what good is your skill, woman? She, like, it didn't, it didn't even end up being all that useful anyway. So, like, all the scenes where we see her spreading her goodness and her magical, lovely, purity bullshit, it ends up being null and void anyway. So that was silly, and it just took away the excuse of giving her anything to do, anything to say, anything to be, because she was just this walking symbol of purity and goodness. And that was all she was, so it was so dull. Um, her relationships with people, like Chris Hemsworth, love him, he's an Aussie, go boy, well, was on Home and Away for years. Um, I'm really proud that he's doing really well. And his Scottish accent, for the most part, was very good, good work, Chris. Um, and I infinitely preferred him when he was a drunken, brawling, like, brooding dude, like, hanging out in bars and troughs and stuff, than when he went on the journey with Snow White, because he seemed so disinterested the whole time, like, Chris, just go home, you know, you don't care, just go home, and because there was zero, literally zero chemistry between him and Kristen, um, so any potential romance between Snow White and the Huntsman, I just didn't care, because nothing was happening between them, the only sense I got it of any inkling of a relationship that could be between them was a brother-sister dynamic. Because he's older and he just had a sort of, sort of mentorship thing going on and he was aiding her kind of, but really reluctant to do it. And that was the only, like, older brother, younger sister, that was all I got from the two of them. So any, <laughs> any notion of a romance just felt really uncomfortable and just misplaced entirely. So the stuff towards the end, I just, you know, it, did, it doesn't work at all because I'm like, I was slightly moved by his little speech before he gives her the kiss because that I took as being this sort of brotherly, platonic affection. And even the kiss when it happened I took as being a, pl a platonic thing. Like I didn't read romance into it at all. At all. So the fact that the whole film has an unresolved romantic subplot was both funny because I was like, they didn't do anything with it, that's hilarious, what a waste of everyone's time. And at the same time I was like, oh yay, they didn't bother to wrap anything up because there was nothing to wrap up. So I like that that nothing happened because nothing could have happened credibly. So that was actually, I was qu kind of pleased with that. Everyone else was sort of like turning to me like, they, they didn't do it, what? Nothing, they didn't do anything. I'm like, yay, nothing happened. So, um... But now I've since learned, I believe, there's going to be a sequel. How the he How do you sequelize Snow White and, and have a valid reason for doing so? There's none. They're just going to try and love triangulate the thing and... Uh, okay, um... Also, the William character, he was okay because uh, if I had to say I supported a relationship in the show, then it would probably be that one because there's kind of some backstory to it, you know, they were friends when they were kids and he still really cares about her, but even then, there was no chemistry there either, and they didn't really interact at all, I think they had the one real conversation that they had and it wasn't even him, it was the queen in disguise, so there was nothing there to, to, you know, build that on either, so either way, Snow White shouldn't end up with either of those guys unless she spends a great deal of time talking to them, and why would they want to be with her? She's boring as batshit, okay. Moving on to the Queen. Um, Charlize Theron handed up good time. She delivered some smoking ham in this film. And lots and lots of it. And so it looked like a lot of fun for her to do. And she just got to storm around and growl a lot. And yeah, it would have been, been fun times. Um, 
I like, I, I, I had to just laugh really because it was just all of it was so obvious. You know, they did the Madonna whore thing. She's wearing her skimpy sort of outfits and she's very over sexualized and using it to her advantage and it's a powerful, frightening tool. Whereas Snow White's really pure and really dull and really boring and not a threat to anybody because she's so innocent. So it was the dichotomy was really, really clear. Um, and so I just found it laughable because it was just so stupid. Um, and yeah, I never, she never see, came, ac came across as like a threatening presence or anything. I just thought she was having fun. I like the, the fact that they attempted to give her a backstory in like two lines of dialogue that were separate from one mother and it didn't work at all. They were trying to like make this commentary on, on superficiality and men's um, obsession with beauty and the perception of women's role in society and all that kind of thing and it just fell away completely and gave no real resonance to her journey or her reasoning for things or her behaviour because it was, they didn't, they're like, we're giving you a tiny, but no, we're not going to bother with that. So it didn't, it just didn't work at all. Um, her relationship with her brother was slightly interesting, I guess. It had that incestuous feel, which a few of the Snow Whites have given the Queen a, a brother that she's had that kind of relationship with, which is interesting. Um, so, you know, that was okay. Um, the fact that you kind of get the hint of um, their past with their mother and the witchcraft and that would have been interesting as well, but it didn't go anywhere either. You only see it for half a second and it's gone. And so, and also, like, at the end of the day, the reasoning for the Queen doing what she does still doesn't make any sense and hold up at all, because if she found that... Um, beauty was something that men valued and uh, obsessed over so much, then wouldn't the answer be what the tribal women did where they marred their faces so beauty couldn't be used against them? Wouldn't that be the more sensible, you know, route to take, really, as opposed to continually seeking beauty and having to go to all this effort just to gain power, and it's superficial power and really fragile at best. I, I don't know, like, I have a hard time following the reasoning of a lot of villains. And also, here's something that I'll, I'll never understand. Why villains want to rule over a dominion that is, like, bleak and desolate and falling apart and crumbling and dark and unhappy and all that sort of thing. So often in these, not just fairy tales, but, like, superhero movies as well, you see the villains, like, standing proudly over the kingdom that they're now ruling, and the kingdom's falling to pieces, and it's all black, and everyone's poor and dying and stuff, but they're really happy, and they're really proud, and this is what they want to rule over. Whereas when they first took over it, the kingdom was all nice and looking really shiny, and the sun was out and stuff. Wouldn't that be the kind of kingdom you'd want to rule over? That, I, you know, I, th I know it's meant to, like, visually symbolise the the evilness of the ruler and the fact that they've let the city crumble to pieces and stuff, but the fact that they always just seem really content, like they're walking around in the bleak, desolate fields, like, yeah, this is my, this is my crib, people. I'm like, how, who would want to rule over that? It doesn't matter if you're evil or a bad person or psychologically messed up. Why would you want to rule over this when you could have a really nice, shiny place like it was in the beginning? I never understand that. So I can never get behind these villains because I just think, you t you're not making sense. You're not making sense. And maybe that's the point, but I don't know. In the end, like, with Snow White especially, the, the person you want to get behind more than anyone else usually ends up being the Queen. So, yeah, I just kind of sat back baffled with her. But it was fun to watch Charlie's hammered around. Um, I know there's been criticism. I believe Warwick Davis criticised the fact that they used um, regular-sized actors to play the dwarves. That, uh, that didn't bother me that much, I mean, you know, I mean, that's not for me to really comment on. I do like the fact that they very clearly, like, stunt casted so that you could get some familiar faces. You're just like, oh, hello, Bob Hoskins. Oh, hello, Nick Frost. Just <laughs> familiar people and Toby Jones just all sitting there having not much to do. I was much more interested when they were, whenever the dwarves were chatting to the Huntsman. I was kind of like, oh, that's more. That's like, I'm, I want to see what their backstory is and how they know one another and stuff. Because uh, there was, like, a comradeship and kind of mateship between them. I thought, that's kind of cool, let's spend time on that, oh no, we're not, okay. So, yeah, it was wasted, but it kind of just, the whole film was obvious, the visuals were great, but for the most part, because it was CGI stuff, I tend not to be that impressed by anything created by a computer, I like real stuff, I like real locations, I like, for the most part, like, real physical props and sets and that sort of stuff, rather than anything created, you know, with a man behind a computer. Um, it still looked really pretty, but... That wasn't enough to save the film and make it worthwhile for me. The dialogue. The dialogue was terrible. The dialogue was all sorts of terrible. Her speech, Snow White's speech, was hilarious. I was actually hunched over laughing. I was like, <laughs> like that. And keep turning to my friends at different moments saying, 
the hell is she talking about? Like, and I, I've read some comments on IMBD where people are trying to stand up for it and defend it and say, well, you know, she's this nervous girl. She's not led an army before. This isn't what her role is. She's not used to it. She's inexperienced and she's really nervous and she was muttering the speech under her breath before she delivered it, so it was like she was practicing it. I'm like, okay, if that's the kind of speech you've actually rehearsed, that's a worry because it there were like a million mixed metaphors that went nowhere and made no sense during the speech. It was just it was fantastically awful. She's like, iron will 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 burn will iron will melt, but it will rise inside itself. Are you my brothers? And you're like, what? What? Huh? How'd you get from there to there? And then everyone's like, yeah, we're with you, Snow White. I'm like, I would not ride into battle with that lunatic. She doesn't know what she's talking about. So. That, yeah, the speech was hysterical, and so much of the dialogue really just came out of left field. You're like, I'm just going to say this now, and it's going to have thematic resonance, and it doesn't. You're like, I don't know why you just said what you said. It doesn't make sense. So, yeah, for the most part, the performances were really, were really quite poor. Kristen Stewart you just couldn't say a lifeless actor, actress rather, for a lifeless character. I'm not saying she hasn't done good work, but not lately, and certainly not in this film. Chris Hemsworth, I mean, lovely accent dude, and I'll always support you, but I feel bad for you getting stuck in this film, and Charlize Theron, I mean, you had fun, so, you know, so long as you had a good time, I suppose, and got to wear some cool costumes, but it was just, yeah, it was trite and obvious and funny, but unintentionally funny, you probably weren't meant to laugh at it nearly as much as I did, so, that's my little kind of rant on Snow White and the Huntsman, I don't think I really have anything more to say, except that the film does not warrant a sequel, I really hope they just decide they don't have the time or money or the actors to do it because I do not want to see that. Um, I hope that, you know, if they do, that poor William just decides that Snow White's bloody boring and goes and goes somewhere else and the Huntsman's like, dude, I'm, I want a drink, I'm going back home. It won't happen. They'll triangle that shit till the cows come home, but, you know, that's my wish anyway. I'm certainly not going to see a sequel if the one does exist. And um, if you want to see a Snow White worth watching, I'd watch Snow White, A Tale of Terror, because at least in that one, Snow White, even though she's still pretty dull, is a bit of a cow. She's not all too nice to the Queen, and Sigourney Weaver plays a really quite sympathetic lunatic as the Queen, and there's actual backstory there and reasons, legitimate reasons behind what she does, and it's a much more interesting and worthwhile dark take on the Snow White tale, so go and watch that instead. Yep, that's what I have to say. Also, just a valid, if superficial, point that I felt I really had to make, because I'm sure we were all probably, maybe, perhaps thinking it, but Kristen Stewart is meant to be more beautiful than Charlize Theron? Really? Charlize Theron was meant to be threatened by the beauty of Kristen Stewart. And how... I'm not saying Kristen Stewart isn't pretty, and of course, how you perceive beauty is entirely uh, subjective and your own, you know, your own opinion. That's totally, totally fine. Um, not trying to sound harsh, but would Charlize Theron have the right to feel threatened by anybody when it comes to beauty? Because I kind of think she's got a pretty firm handle on that, and she doesn't have to worry, so... Yeah, Kristen Stewart, I don't think, is about to usurp Charlie's in the, in the looks category, so... Maybe that felt a tad not too believable.